Hello, everyone, and welcome to our training. Collaboration is your cybersecurity secret weapon. My name is John Monroe, and I'm the director of content here at GovLoop. And today, I'm also your moderator. Spe thanks so much for joining me. And a special thanks to Lumen Technologies for sponsoring this training. So let's get started. You know, when it comes to cybersecurity, one of the emerging trends in state and local government is what's known as whole of state security. The idea is for state and local governments to work together to understand and manage risks and to respond to incidents effectively. So that's what we'll be talking about today. But before we get to that, I'd like to just cover some housekeeping items. First, if you're on Twitter, please share what you learned. Just use the hashtag GLTrain. We have some great resources available for you to download from the console, so be sure to check those out. If you want to access the closed captioning feature, just look for the icon at the bottom right-hand side of the media player. And of course, we hope you don't have any technical difficulties, but if you do, just send a message through that Ask a Question tab, and my colleague Maddie will help you out. And you can use that same tab to submit questions to our speakers, and we want your questions, so don't be shy. And finally, I want to let you know that we are recording this training, and tomorrow we'll email you a link where you can watch the session on demand or share it with a colleague. All right, with all that housekeeping out of the way, let me introduce you to our amazing speakers. We are joined today by James Weaver. Jim is the Secretary for Information Technology and State CIO for North Carolina. He leads the state's Department of Information Technology, which is responsible for strategic IT planning and the procurement and delivery of IT services and solutions, as well as cybersecurity. Prior to, to this role, Jim served as the CIO for the state of Washington. We are also joined today by Vinod Brahmapuram from Lumen. Vinod is Lumen's Senior Director of Security for State and Local Government and Education. With his 25 years of, uh, of IT experience, Vinod has held cybersecurity leadership positions in three states, advising governors and legislators on key cyber issues. Before jo joining Lumen, he served as the Chief Information Security Officer for the state of Washington. So uh, folks, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us. So, Thank you. Yeah, so Thank let's you. get Thank started. You. Yeah, no, really glad. I mean, I think this is such a hot topic, and you guys have both, you know, you're, you've been there, and you know what this is about. So, but let's kind of step back. For those for whom this is kind of a new topic, let's start with the definition. What is meant by whole of state, a, a whole of state approach to cybersecurity? Jim, what, how do you define this? Well, let me, let me start by wishing everybody happy Diwali Day or Diwali Week. Um, North Carolina is home to one of the largest uh, temples here outside of Raleigh. And today was our agency celebration, so we value diversity and inclusion. And so I am in the traditional garb here um, and working with our colleagues here and celebrating this wonderful week with them all. So when we talk about a uh, holistic of state approach, I mean, I, I think for me, a, I'm very fortunate to have a governor. Governor Cooper is very much interested and wants to know what's going on across the cyber landscape. Um, it's awesome to have executive level support that continues to be engaged and wants to know what can be done better. But getting back to your fundamental question here, really around, it's about, you know, in the military, we talk about common operating picture or COP. It's really about what is going on within our state's borders from a cyber security uh, perspective. And, and yes, data flows in and out of the data, but out of the borders, but we're still very much focused on what is occurring within our state, both from a critical infrastructure aspect, uh, from a government aspect. And here in North Carolina, government's identified as state, local, K through 12, all the school districts, uh, community college, and the university system, uh, or I should say University of North Carolina system. So we have higher ed, we also have um, public schools, and then a local government as well. So when we talk about government here, it's all those kind of entities. And that's kind of, I don't know if that's unique to us, but at least it starts bringing some common elements together across government. So when we talk about the need to do reporting, all those elements are required to report within 24 hours. As soon as we get a report in of, a, of an incident, um, we, we're very fortunate to have a joint cyber task force that is automatically ready to go. So as a scoping call is occurring, um, we and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about the Joint Cyber Task Force a little bit later, so I don't want to get into all the nuances of it. But we are very, very quickly able to pivot 
and provide the right level of support, get boots on ground, if you will, to the impacted entity and begin, uh, you know, identifying impacted areas, doing containment and doing eradication, if you think about the, the three main things that you're focusing on. But the one thing the governor challenged me as I came into North Carolina was to raise the overall bar of cybersecurity. So not to have the bar get lowered, but to bring everybody up to a common level as well. And, and so, again, to be able to do that is for all of us to understand what's going on within our state borders. We also got to recognize that government entities don't have the same capabilities. Um, even at the state level, we have varying agencies that have different capabilities. Uh, local governments, um, we have three, uh, a three-tier county system. Tier three are your more affluent counties. Tier one and tier two are your, are your less affluent areas. And for some tier one counties, the IT guy is probably also the guy who's mowing the grass, who's, who's doing three or four other things. And, and so we have to make sure that, and they're, by the way, they're also running critical infrastructure systems as well in, in some cases. So it's to bring them along in the journey as well. And it's not about big brother. This is not a, a big brother approach that, you know, it's, it's Raleigh, it's state government coming down. But really, it's about how do we improve and protect the overall data that sits here in the state of North Carolina, protecting our residents, our North Carolinians, our businesses. You know, we have the largest financial market outside of Wall Street sitting in Charlotte. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things here that puts North Carolina as a target of interest and that we take that role very seriously. And it's bringing all those resources together because at the end of the day, um, it's one team, one fight. And I would be remiss to tell you that if our legislature also supports this concept and is very much behind it, um, we were the first state to ever pass anti-ransomware legislation. Uh, that mm -hmm. bill got signed uh, late last year and went into effect January 15th here of this calendar year. Um, so, again, it now makes it illegal for any governmental entity to negotiate or pay for ransomware here in the state of North Carolina. So it's, it's bringing that together, one team, one fight, and that, that, that entire state approach to how we, how we do cybersecurity here in the state. Vinod, I'd like to get your perspective. I mean, like I mentioned, you know, you've, you've been in leadership positions in three different states. Kind of how do you see this issue? Yeah, great question, uh, John. So if we look at, look at it from a resident perspective, the same resident is a resident of the state, is a resident of the county, a resident of the city, right? It's the same person. Ultimately, or when we talk about government within a state, whether it is state government, county government, local government, our ta the role, the purpose of government is to serve the residents, right? So this whole of state really isn't anything different. Really what it is, is trying to connect all different levels of government to really serve the residents better by protecting their information, by protecting our services to ensure that, uh, that they always have the services that they need. That's this is that's where uh, that's pretty much the whole of state cybersecurity. I know Jim covered it very well. So this is definitely a this is this isn't anything new. It is. It is a realization that we need to have the resident in the center and really start looking at how how are all of our services connecting and what does this mean to the resident and how do we ensure that it is always there for that person and what has to happen behind the scenes. And that's what this whole of state cybersecurity is about. Well, let me ask you this. Let me follow up on that. You know, as I mentioned, this seems to be an emerging trend. You know, we're hearing, you know, a number of states are looking at this. But no, why, why do you think this is happening now? What's sort of, why now? <laughs> I think I would call this the trajectory of evolution. Like if we look at how things were maybe two decades ago, John, technology was even like, even if you look at the curve, how technology was uh, growing, Technology was looked at as, yes, it is enabling business, but it didn't really have all the attention that what has what technology has received over the last couple of years or maybe a decade. And cybersecurity is a little bit behind as well in the curve, mm -hmm. as we know. So it's not why now. I think we are now almost, we are seeing that the ecosystem, as I described, we are all connected. For example, a state health department has so much of connectivity with the county and city systems. 
to really deliver health services right so we because we live in a connected we are we live in a connected space we know that the moment something happens in one area there is going to be a downstream impact again to the service delivery to the residents right so what we are seeing is that we cannot be siloed there is no such thing called executive branch judicial branch legislative branch county government city government we know that we are in a connected ecosystem and we really again a person has one identity you have one name john i have one name right we have one identity that has to be protected that has to be served services have to be rendered to that individual so when we look at it from that perspective we realize we we quickly learn that this is something that is this is what we need to we should be doing and it is not new at all again going back to what we are saying yeah. i think what we are realizing now is yes we cannot just protect in one area and leave the other areas open there's going to be an impact so we better take that whole of state approach to really protect our service system excellent so jim John, i like to add you mentioned you got that yeah actually i was i was going yeah, okay, to yeah. yes please <laughs> I, I think the other thing that i mean again uh 2020 changed a lot of things yes um the pandemic drove change especially in public sector it drove how we operate how we service constituents um in our respective states how those benefits and services as we pushed out a remote workforce and now all of a sudden things that we used to be able to handle internally from a security aspect um now we just pushed all that workload out of our network and it's now sitting on the perimeter on the edge and, and i think the, those business opportunities have now driven to a different type of conversation. As we went through mm -hmm. 2020, we saw, you know, the impacts of pandemic unemployment. Uh, Vinod and I lived through some fun together in the state of Washington during our time together. Um, we, we saw the, you know, again, how do we secure these workstations working from home? Um, all that kind of stuff now, I think, has really driven a different cultural mindset than probably what was there in 2019. So while the technology continues to advance, threat actors continue to advance and, and do uh, very nefarious things. And as more as we have COVID, we have whatever else is coming around, there's all this opportunity to, for nefarious actors to um, enlicit or entice people to fall victim to fraudulent opportunities. And I think this is why we have to marshal our, re our resources a little bit differently than what we've done in the past uh, to be effectively a combat force against that. Excellent. All right, Jim, well, let me ask you this. So obviously this is needed. It's, it's, it's valuable, but what are the challenges in this whole of state approach? What are some of the challenges that you see that, you know, that you've encountered that other people might encounter? You want me to go first? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the first, the first thing that we found is, and, and again, our, our joint cyber task force does phenomenal work. Um, you know, Governor Cooper uh, formally recognized the, the Joint Cyber Task Force in an executive order 254 back in March of this year. But the JCTF has been actually operating in four, for over four years, and it was driven out of necessity. Um, and one of, the, one of the first challenges we have is resources. Um, there's over 21,000 cyber jobs today in North Carolina across public and private sector that are unfilled. And that number is going to continue to grow. Um, so again, we, we, how, we have to look at how we marshal our resources because we, we don't have the luxury of having uh, 15 people dedicated to doing a cyber function. We might have three. How do we maximize those three individuals? And as the Joint Cyber Task Force has been extremely successful in doing its mission, we've also seen now where we, we've, we don't have the bench strength we once had. And, and so again, it's continuing to bring uh, new folks into play, getting them up to speed across the myriad of tool sets that are that are being used. Uh, for us at the state level, it's really we've increased our dependence upon the Joint Cyber Task Force because they do have the ability to do some advanced threat hunting that we otherwise don't necessarily have the people for. But on the National Guard side, some of those um, airmen and National Guard soldiers are able to get that training as part of their regular curriculum and um, their military job. The fact that the National Guard, the Army National Guard, at least anyway, now has a, a military occupational specialty that is cyber focused. Um, and I'm sure the Air Guard has the same thing. Uh, so I think resources and the availability of resources and continuing that talent pipeline through and being able to maximize it, that's one of our biggest challenges. The other thing that we've seen so far, too, as, as we've been very successful in doing some things, 
um, it's being able to disengage from that activity, right? Um, especially if we go out into some of our um, local government opportunities and, and really uh, they, they find a lot of value as to what the Joint Cyber Task Force brings. But, you know, there's a point in time where we have to disengage, right? The, the Joint Cyber Task Force is not there to run day-to-day -day operations. It's there to resolve the incident, contain it, eradicate it. Um, here are things that you should be looking to do uh, in the future, uh, so you can go ahead and enhance and strengthen your cybersecurity posture, but it's not there to do day-to-day -day cyber activities. And very quickly, a, an entity starts, hey, could you do this for us? Could you do that for us? What do you think about this? And we have to kind of cut that umbilical cord and bring those folks back onto the bench because, um, as you know, cyber does not go away. Uh, here in North Carolina, we're seeing billions of events daily. Um, on any given week, it's anywhere from 10 billion to 13 billion events that are handled in a very automated fashion. And as you can imagine, we have to be right all the time. The bad person only has to be right once um, to get in. So I think those are our biggest challenges right now as we're seeing things. Believe it or not, it's not funding. Um, you know, again, like I said, the governor, the General Assembly here in North Carolina very much sees the value of what the Joint Cyber Task Force brings uh, to the table. And I should say that Besides the National Guard, my agency is a core founding member of the National Guard Emergency Management uh, here in the state because cyber is an incident, right? They know how to run incidents. We got these things called hurricanes that roll through and different things, and they know how to do that very well. Um, and then we have an organization that's called Nickel Giza, North Carolina Local Government Information Systems Association. That's the representation of our local government partners. And so depending upon if it's a state level, if it's a state agency incident, DIT, my agency is on point. If it's a local government uh, entity, Nickel G's is on point in working with that impacted entity. So again, it's it's that awareness and making sure that we have the right people engaged, um, so it doesn't look like it's the city of or Raleigh here, the capital, coming in and taking over. That's not what we want. Our National Guard's uh, men and women are are coming in behind the scenes and and doing that augmentation and support. And again, our emergency management personnel know how to run an incident and. That's exactly what they're focused on is making sure from an incident aspect, those things are occurring because you can't have your incident person also being the one trying to fight the fire. Yeah, got it. But no, what about from what your perspective, what do you see as some of the challenges that, you know, people need to be mindful of if, as they move to this kind of model? Yeah, I think Jim was touching on these uh, for the very first question as well. I'll break it down in three levels, John. So that we are going to see challenges for initiating a whole of state cybersecurity to design whole of state cybersecurity and to execute whole of state cybersecurity. Jim touched on very important points. I'll uh, add a couple of more things under those three buckets. So to initiate whole of state cybersecurity, Jim was mentioning this as well. There can be there can be some some misperceptions that we are seeing in states where people think this is a big brother trying to reach in and trying to do things. That's not really what it is. As, as Jim mentioned, this is about putting together one team for one fight. The bad actors are very unified. They work so well together, they come together, they help each other, and here, if we don't do it, it is like almost like trying to go to a gunfight with a stick. So, so to coming back to what I mentioned about the initiation challenges, it's a culture change. We have to help everybody understand that. Look, the act, the threat activity is exponentially increasing. We cannot do things the way we are because we also saw how many attacks happened over the last couple of years. They're exponentially increasing, right? So there is a culture change. There is a understanding. There's a level set. There's a mind shift that has to happen that this is the right thing that we have to come together. Now comes the design challenges. Look at North Carolina, what Jim was pointing. Look at other sta every state. There is The state is at a different maturity level when it comes to cybersecurity. The state executive branch. Then the state will have a couple of counties or cities that are very well that are very well established, that have a very good cybersecurity program, then you can have counties and cities that are kind of like at the mid-level, then at, the, at folks who are very, very struggling. When you have a spectrum, how do you create, how do you normalize, right? 
how do you execute now on a whole of state? Because you don't want to bring down a person who already has a mature program, but then while trying to get other people up to almost a baseline. So it's, it's a, it is a science. It's not going to be easy. That's where, going back to the theme of our presentation here, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. We need people to come together to collaborate and say, how do we do a design that is very specific to each and every state? Because every state is going to be different. Every, every, every state's chemistry is going to be different. So you have design challenges. Then comes execution. Again, creating the right roadmap. And as Jim was mentioning too, this is about really pulling together every resource that you have and really maximizing those resources to the best extent possible. Three people don't need to be doing you know, probably the slice, maybe the three folks can do so much. What is that? So really looking into the execution to maximize what we can afford so that there's going to be those challenges. So this whole of state cybersecurity, it's going to be a challenge. However, it is the right thing to do. And I think we all are very well positioned to do. We all can learn from each other. Again, we don't have to go at it alone. That's the whole purpose of collaboration. If one state is leading, whether it is North Carolina, as Jim mentioned, there is always another state that is looking to learn lessons and say, what worked well for your state? Let me try that here, right? So that's how I see where even the challenges, while there are challenges, I don't think it is insurmountable because we always can point to a state that was able to overcome those challenges and energize ourselves. Mm -hmm. so. Excellent. Hey, Jim, let me ask you this. How did you get buy-in for this approach? Uh, first, kind of from the low, you know, the, from local governments. You know, as you said, you know, you know, you don't want this to be feel like Big Brother. So, how did you kind of get their buy-in so that they saw the value in this? So, again, I'll go back to our uh, North Carolina Local Government Information Systems Association. So, Nickel Giza. Um, if you say that five times rapidly, you get a gold star here at the end of the show. Uh, so Nickel Giza is a core representation of local government across the state of North Carolina. North Carolina has 100 counties, as an example, and uh, 40 of them are designated as Tier 1, 40 are designated as Tier 2, and then 20 are designated as Tier 3, and Tier 3 being the more, um, I guess the right word is affluent, but more, they have more capability and capacity. Um, the other thing that we've done as well as part of our Joint Cyber Task Force is we included the UNC School of Government, so we have representation from there as well. Um, which also gets us that tie-in now to higher education uh, likewise. So um, as we come together as a joint cyber task force, Nickel Giza is sitting at the table. And normally, if it's a local government, as I said earlier, if it's a local government-related um, incident, Nickel Giza is driving the conversation. They're driving the scoping call. Everyone else is a partner sitting around um, to include our federal partners. Um, even though we don't have our federal partners named in the executive order per se because they're federal government, FBI, Secret Service, Homeland, um, those organizations are sitting there with this as well. The other thing that we'll end up doing as well is we'll bring in other partnering agencies as we need to. So as an example, if a county government uh, is being impacted uh, in our human services world, county governments are the ones who are meeting with um, citizens and, and engaging in those business transactions, if you will. We will bring that uh, a representative from Health and Human Services to sit there so they can help ascertain impacts um, and, and making sure that we're accounting for any necessary reporting requirements that may need to be done at a federal government level. Uh, if it's a school district or Department of Public Instruction, even though it's a separately elected official, they will have somebody sitting at the table with us and they will get engaged from that as well. So we have a very dynamic uh, ability to augment the core group of those four agencies that are there um, as we're talking about it. Uh, the other thing that, that comes about too is, is when we talk about IIJA, cyber funding, um, that was part of the Biden administration's Infrastructure Investments Job Act, um, our JCTF is the core, and we're leveraging as our core planning group. So our joint cyber task force, in, in a lot of cases, a lot of our, our, our men and women in the National Guard um, are out doing penetration testing, vulnerability assessments at these local government level entities at no cost to them. Again, free, zero. We are covering that cost uh, through, um, you know, budget uh, allocations coming from the General Assembly being requested by the governor, feeding into my budget and doing the MOU to account for the, uh, the cost of those men and women who are going out there. So 
our, our forces have the have a lot of visibility in what is out there and what has occurred, either through proactive means of doing vulnerability assessments, penetration testing, um, going through that process, or unfortunately, if they had to be involved from a, an incident response aspect. But that's given us a lot of visibility into what's occurring here in the state across all levels of government. 911, um, so our next generation, our PSAPs, our, our uh, 911 call centers, um, that, that falls under me as well. And we also have done cyber assessments of our PSAP community. So we know exactly what vulnerabilities are there. So again, we're bringing this all together. We're looking at the commonalities. Um, you, we're not gonna be able to fix everything, but you know, if we see, here's our top 10 list, this is what we're going after. Nothing's more frustrating than um, having our forces go out there do a vulnerability assessment and say, hey, here's where we think you're very vulnerable. And the entity puts it in the filing cabinet and checks a box saying, I got my vulnerability assessment done. And then six months later, they got victimized. And you go back and, oh, that, 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 you know. So we want to make sure that as we're going out there and we're doing this, we're also able to come back around and help them uh, you know, remediate, mitigate the situation and get to, again, raising that cybersecurity posture uh, of our government entities so we can make sure ultimately at the end of the day we're protecting our residents data our businesses data and those critical services that they're providing out to all north carolinians and it sounds like you really do make a point of making sure local government has that voice it, have yes. you know, have you got some feedback on that do you feel like they do feel like they're heard yeah i yeah i, I believe that's the case um you know again we we recognize especially our tier three counties um like when i look here mecklenburg where charlotte is when i look at wake county where raleigh is um we're not as worried about them because we know they have the capabilities to do things that they have a voice they can um provide input into what we're working on and focused on but at the same time i also know that we don't necessarily have to worry about them because they have the resources to go make things happen and, and get things done Whereas when I look at those tier one, tier two counties, um, you know, I, I can still remember a county commissioner um, of a more rural county basically saying, Mr. Secretary, I don't think nobody's going to care about my county. We're just little rural, you know, blah, blah, blah here in North Carolina. And, I, and I'm like, respectfully, sir, you know, you actually run the water filtration system. You run the sewage system. What happens if people can't get water or can't flush commodes? What What happens? Um, you know, and, and, and so it, it's just trying to level set that expectation that um, folks sometimes think that cyber is about, oh, it's, a, it's hacking into this massive computer system and this, this and this. There's things that can do that impact people's lives on a daily basis that are not necessarily, I hate to use the word IT you know, necessary. Um, when we talk about it, a lot of times it's about the big data breaches across major corporations. There's local utility systems that are equally um, exposed that we have to make sure we're shoring up. And then the other thing we're really working hard on too is our critical infrastructure partners. So uh, Colonial Pipeline, Duke Energy as an example, uh, bringing them to the table, learning from them. Uh, what have you seen? What are you, what are you seeing? What do your tabletop exercises look like? Here's what we're doing. What do you think we should be doing differently based upon some things that you've gone through? Um, and, and so we're trying to bridge that gap between private infra critical infrastructure um, entities and public sector, again, to get to more of a holistic approach here in the state. Excellent. But note, I'd like to get your perspective. Kind of what do you see as the key to making this kind of cross-government relationships work? So the first and foremost thing is I I don't believe anybody should approach this as though they are trying to dictate, <laughs> right, John? <laughs> so again, coming back to the core aspect of collaboration, we have to recognize that cybersecurity is a business issue. What that means is the business owners need to be empowered to make the decisions. So when we try to bring together the state, local, county governments together for whole of state cybersecurity, what we really want to do is create an avenue for sharing best practices to say that look this is the right thing to do now let's look at let's look at the big picture let's figure out can we do it what are the hurdles how can we do it rather than saying no i don't want to do this right we need to what we have to do is really bring the best practices to the forefront and give the local governments enough latitude to see what has to be customized specific to their business. So let them have a say in it. 
so they feel empowered and it's very important to empower them with that as well because again going back every business owner so if, whether it's at the local level county level state level the business owners understand their business it's important for now those avenues to raise awareness on the business risk because that's what security is about it is about managing risk ultimately so what we really it comes down to is let's help the person understand the risk be and provide folks in a forum the best practices that we need to utilize to get our security posture better and how do we get there and help, help folks chime in really help because this is all about bringing all the different brain power together and looking at all the different challenges and then trying to address that i think that's what is going to work well and i think still quite a few states are already doing a, a fantastic job doing exactly that john so all right but i'd like to stick with you where does technology help in this whole approach? What is the role that technology can play in, in kind of making this whole of state approach work? And, you know, and how does how can industry help? Yeah, yeah, great question. So really speaking, the reason I mean a major reason why we are talking about whole of state cybersecurity, John, is because of technology, technology that is connecting all of us, right? Gone are the days, as we know, where you walk into an office. You fill out a paper form and your records stay in that office. <laughs> it's, that's not at all the case, right? Everything, we live in electronic world and everything is connected. We live in a connected space. So first of all, the reason for whole of state cybersecurity is the underpinning, the underlying technology that connects all of us. Now, to go take it one step further, what role does technology play? Like, really, if we look at uh, the type of role technology can play, we need to start really focusing on utilizing technology best practices by reducing the data footprint because it is the same person, again, as I said, when they go to a state for services, when they go to a county, when they go to a city, there are so many data elements that a person should probably not repeat and repeat and repeat because the larger the data footprint is, the more it gets challenging to really protect it. So how do we intelligently share data between the county, city, state, in areas that it has to happen. So that's where technology can play. Going back to how the industry partners can play a role, industry partners, if we look at all industries, like really we have the bandwidth, I, I, I hate to use the word bandwidth, but let's say let's say, let's say we have the, the resources, even when it comes to financial resources, you can invest in research, you can invest in predictive capabilities, right? Let's start predicting what are the needs, what are the evolving needs of state government, local government, county government. How So you, you can start utilizing that predictive knowledge to really start positioning government for success. Because that's, if we look at what, as Jim mentioned too, if we just take a step back and look what the lab, what the pandemic did to technology and security, really it pushed government to innovate every agency every state really the biggest bigger theme right now is how do we innovate how do we transform everyone wa everyone wants to transform the operation so what this really means is for industry partners to come together really with the forecast really with the predictive knowledge to say look this is where we are going to be heading to a couple of years from now these are going to be the trends this is what can happen Let's start utilizing all this predictive knowledge to get ourselves strong, to get ourselves better, help ourselves modernize, really help enable citizen services get better each day. So I think that that's where industries need to play play a bigger role is to be innovators. So, Excellent. Jim, I'd be interested in your perspective on technology. Yeah. So what role do you well, see for technology in this yeah, so let me, I, I'm going to probably echo a lot of what Manoj just said, but from a different perspective. Um, the technology is there today to enable things to occur much, much differently and much, much quicker than has been in the past. What we have to focus on is the people process component of this, because Manoj's 100% correct with uh, all the points he brought out there. Uh, you know, again, do we need a copy of a driver's license in 15 different disparate systems? Um, no, we don't. The technology is there today to allow for a check to go out to a DMV or a Department of Transportation and 
look at a picture and validate an address. But we have these historic processes or legacy processes that continue to go forward of how we've always done business. And that's the mindset we need to start changing a little bit differently. Um, we, you know, we have to start thinking about things a little bit different when we talk about individual identity, um, as an example. Um, if a, uh, a, a 21 year old male man or woman walks into a bar and do they need to show their driver's license and, and sit there and see date of birth? And then, oh, by the way, here's my address and everything else that somebody that I don't know gets to see. Or does the bar actually just need to know this person's 21, right? So, again, changing that conversation. If there's an age requirement for a certain service, why do we need to collect date of birth? If we can validate and say, yes, this person meets that criteria. So it's that people process kind of thought different thinking that needs to start uh, occurring across, uh, I think, government in general of how we've always done business versus what, how we should probably do business moving forward. Um, that's going to help reduce the threat we have to the, the, the immense amount of data uh, that we all own as states or local governmental entities. Excellent. All right, Jim, I want to stick with you. What benefits, you know, what outcomes have you seen so far from this approach? What would you point to and what are you looking for down the road? So, I mean, as far as benefits go, I mean, first and foremost, uh, you know, the, the, the formalization of the Joint Cyber Task Force has been huge for us. Um, it also allows us to now start training together. Um, so as an example, when, and again, I'm part of the North Carolina National Guard and I'm part of the Cybersecurity Response Force, so just in full disclosure. But when we go and participate in exercises at the National Guard level, like every year, uh, Department of Defense has CyberShield. Our state CISO, our deputy state CISO, comes along with us and participates in that exercise with the North Carolina team um, in various roles. And again, this helps to do that training, that, that cohesiveness of um, getting to know everybody, learning strengths and weaknesses, um, and that familiarity and camaraderie uh, pays dividends when we go out and we're in an, uh, in an incident uh, response type thing. The other thing we also have been able to do is because of those. Well, I think we just lost your sound, Jim. Yeah, we lost him for a second. Did we lose gotcha. John? Okay. I'll just keep going and uh, hopefully fill in there the you time. Are. Okay, okay there we are. Right. Okay. Yeah, so, John, so I was just saying, when we have the weekend uh, opportunities for training with our National Guard resources, there are times where we will do tabletop exercises and bring uh, public sector people in, engaged as part of those exercises, again, to continue that renewed training um, focus. Um Continue working with our, our local government stakeholders. It's, it's just been huge, and it opens up other doors for opportunity and conversation uh, on other IT services and that are available and, and possibly for consideration by uh, local governments, whether it's city, municipality, or, or county level. And then the other thing too is is that we have a demonstrated success record, and you know that that is something that drives credibility and we have credibility the legislature is willing to go ahead and support and fund those things so as we continue to move forward in our last budget cycle is the first time we got reoccurring funding uh from the general assembly here in north carolina um so very proud that we were able to do that but we were able to do that through a demonstrated effectiveness of what's been occurring across the state and being able to tackle some of these realistic cybersecurity issues that that occur on a daily basis Excellent. Benoit, I'd be curious to hear from you. Where do you, how do you see this situation, this approach evolving over the next couple of years? What, what do you expect to happen? I think this is going to catch a lot of traction in a very short amount of time, uh, John, because especially going back to some of the drivers coming from the federal government, right? We saw mm -hmm. uh, what, since the pandemic, we saw a heavy flow of federal funds coming into states, whether it was the for money from the CARES Act, whether it was the American Rescue, money from the American Rescue Plan. Now we have the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act funding that's coming to the states, right? With each of these funding, certainly cities, counties, they all were able to make progress, whether 
investing, making some capital investments, like buying some security products. Now, certainly they are looking for leadership from, from the state government to see, okay, I need help. How do we do this? And that's exactly what the uh, CISA, the role of CISA is as well, uh, especially as part of some of these federal funding. They are clearly establishing the need. I really like how the, uh, uh, the funding opportunity has been constructed around basic 16 required elements. It says these are the things that are really needed and that didn't come from any thin air, right? As we know, it was very thoughtful, very mindful. How do we really establish a a step-by-step -step maturity level across the state. So this is getting a lot of traction. It is getting a lot of support. More and more government leaders, as Jim is pointing from his own personal experience as well, more and more government leaders are leaning in and saying, we have to look at it from a whole of state approach. I can personally say that even when I was working in Washington, it didn't matter what the authorizing environment is for the state chief information security officer. We would get calls from the from government leaders saying, I had this attack happen in my county, in this city. How can you help? So now, with this whole concept of whole of state cybersecurity, more and more government leaders, that they want to chime in, support. They are sponsoring legislations. They are sponsoring funding. federal count. So this is just going to be one of the hardest things that we are going to be doing over the next couple of years. And this is going to catch a lot of steam very fast. Okay, great. And actually, let, let me stay with you. So if you're talking to a state cyber official who's kind of thinking of, you know, jumping into this, what advice would you have for them? Are there best practices, advice? What would you tell them? I would, my, my first advice is to tell them not even trying to, like, please don't try to reinvent the wheel because that's what we have, resources like CISA, right? Learn from states that have already started the journey, whether it is North Carolina, Washington. Uh, there are quite a few states. Uh, they are also coming up, coming up with a different model as well. Uh, I'm very, very glad to, f I'm closely following the model that New York State has introduced with their cyber officer, uh, in addition to the chief information security officer they have, Louisiana has done the same thing. Ohio is doing the same thing where they know they have to dedicate a person who is going to advise or really have reach into the local and local government's needs and being able to really bring those points to government leaders. Those models. So what I would what I would suggest is first, yes, please don't try to reinvent the wheel. Second thing is really, really creating a forum for collaboration. You need folks who can bring in the business needs, who can really influence the need for us to embrace this whole of state cybersecurity because that's what we have to do. So we re really need to focus on um, putting together a good group, a working group. And this working group, like really it's about building the right governance is where I would start. To simplify, let me maybe that, maybe that uh, that's where I would like to start and stop there, John. Let's build the right governance relevant to your state. That is the advice I would give for anyone who wants to start whole of state cybersecurity. I think it all starts with governance. So, Excellent. And Jim, what advice would you have? <laughs> Sorry about that. We have the sensor lights. So. <laughs> so, you know, three things that come to immediate mind. Uh, and again, I'll speak for, as a state CIO um, at that level, um, not necessarily from the cyber aspect, but if you have not sat down and met your adjutant general of your state, do so immediately. Um, sit down, have that conversation, see what the world of possibilities could look like because the National Guard is in a unique area that they can, one of their core missions is to help the state, right? That's the second hat. I mean, we're two missions. Yes, we got the federal government mission. We got a state government mission. Um, and at, there's an awesome bench sitting out there waiting to be tapped into. Have that conversation with your adjutant general in your state if you have not done so already. Secondly, is really about in, engaging with your stakeholders, especially local government entities, um, and getting that trust and that credibility built up with them. Um, I can remember, and, and Vinod, as you were talking about the cities and counties calling in, in Washington, I still remember that the one entity who got ransomware, and the poor gentleman, he had the deer in the headlight look like, oh, my God, yeah. I, the, the worst possible thing I could have imagined just happened to me. And, yeah. you know, we were all there collectively. Do this, then this, then, I mean, so, you know, having... Because you're at your worst moment and you're not thinking clearly when you've been ransomware or something else like that. And having the, those colleagues around you to kind of work with you makes a world of difference. And then lastly, I would say, you know, the first rule of Fight Club is don't talk about Fight Club. 
but you have to be when we when we think about that for cyber a lot of a lot of times but you really need to be brutally honest with the governor and the administration and the legislature they need to understand what's occurring what's going on and not with anecdotal stuff um with facts and figures and showing what what is occurring where are our vulnerabilities what what are the things that we need to go tackle you'd be surprised at the level of interest and the questions that you will get back um and so again i'm very fortunate here in north carolina i, I have governor cooper is very much all in on cybersecurity. i got a general assembly who very much understands cybersecurity and is willing to back us up as much as they need to and again that was evident by finally getting first time ever reoccurring funding but it was coming and having those honest conversations about this is where we're at this is where we need to be here's our vulnerabilities here's what i want to try to fix first you know and here's my plan for the next three to five years i'm not gonna be able to get this all done so you know as i told some legislative members if you gave me all this money right now i'd implode because i can't do it but this is what i'm gonna do this is step one i'm gonna get this done i'm gonna do step two next i'm gonna do step three next by the way to get to step four i'm coming back and asking for more money um and, and so you build that credibility and you start getting those working relationships with key members in the legislature as well as again um, with the governor and the administration that makes a world of difference, but you got to have honesty there. Um, at the end of the day, bad news does not get better with time. So the, the you know, honest day works. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to thank Jim and Vinod for sharing their insights today. What a just a delightful conversation. So much going on. Um, so just a few quick reminders before you go. As I said earlier, we have some great resources available for you to download from the console, so be sure to check those out. And like I said earlier, tomorrow we're going to send you a link to an on-demand version of this training. So look for that in your inboxes, you know, watch it again, share it with a colleague, whatever helps. So on behalf of GovLoop and Lumen Technologies, I hope you have enjoyed the session. As we always say, we appreciate all the work that you do, and we thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. So please hope you have a great rest of the day.